Hello, Psych and Law. Welcome to the Psychology of Victim and Victimization. It's Lecture 6. And uh, here we are, oh, maybe about a third of the way through the course. Uh, there's some big, hefty lectures ahead of us. This one is relatively compact, and uh, there's no homework assignment associated with this, although quiz questions will be uh, tapping into some of the material in this particular lecture. This is going to be followed by Lecture 6.1, which further explores the idea of victimization, essentially with a book report, if you will, on uh, The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. So stay tuned. Let's get started. Now, measuring victimization might be different than measuring crime. So we know from previous lecture, hi, Annika, you come to help us out. All right, so the UCR, the Unified Crime Reporting, remember, is conducted by the FBI, uh, and it's kind of a clearinghouse for all crime statistics. But we also kind of offered the idea, does everyone report it when they're victim of a crime? And as we discussed, maybe not so much. So there was a definite need to tap into another aspect of criminality that is victimization. So the, the, the National Crime Victimization Study, the NCVS, is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Justice and the first survey was conducted way back in 73 and this is a survey, right? They actually contact people so it's, it's a telephone survey, right? And 80,000 people, 12 and over, and 43,000 households. It's conducted twice a year by the Census Bureau interviews and, and the the Participants remain in the study for three years, so they roll people in and out of the study. The website is listed there if you want to go check it out. So what do we know then? Well, let's make the comparison. The UCR submitted to the FBI by law enforcement agencies. The NCVS taps into direct victimization perceptions by citizens. So. The NCVS then measures both reported and unreported victimization, right? So it taps into, it kind of captures those people who fail to report crimes to the police. They may, in fact, report them to the NCVS. And, and may is a big word there, but, but obviously NCVS figures we would think would be larger than UCR figures, all else being equal. And this is what we find, that crimes are unreported. Un, I'm sorry, underreported. So going back to 2002, 49% of violent crime and 40% of property crimes were reported. That leaves the majority of crimes of this nature going unreported. Uh, and, and crimes against women are more likely to be reported than crimes against men, and we can ask, uh, you know, kind of the psychology behind that. Well, many men might feel that if they report certain crimes, they may be kind of given up their man card, that it's that's less than manly to, to appear as a victim. Uh, so that might be part of the gender effect there. So, 23 million victimizations, violent crime, 7.4 million people, uh, rape 1.5 per thousand persons, and, and remember, of industrialized countries, the United States has one of the highest incidents of rape uh, in, in that list. Murders was, uh, was 15,980, most victims, and here's where it gets important to start to understand the nature of crime. Most victims, 75%, right, and 90% and of the offenders are male, so murder is by far and away a male-on-male -male crime, right? Most victims of murder knew their murderer, uh, uh, what, 76%, and the majority of murders in the United States involve a firearm, and, and that shouldn't be surprising. Let's face it, a firearm is an easy way. Uh, you can stand off at a distance. Uh, it doesn't require getting close and personal. Uh, using a knife to kill someone is a very committed act, and it, it brings one in close proximity to the victim. Uh, so firearms really facilitate murder, and, and uh, what do we know about the NCVS 2018? We're going to, you know, kind of try and keep data current. No statistical significant change occurred in the rate of violent crime from 2014. 
20.1 victimizations to 18.6 per thousand uh, in 2015. No statistically significant uh, change was detected in the percentages of violent crime recorded to the police. So it's essentially uh, kind of a very consistent instrument. The rate of property crime decreased from 118.1 uh, per thousand households in 2014 to 110.7 in, in 2015. And I think that's kind of an amazing statistic. Uh, although it'll be interesting. Notice there's a lot of lag time in, in the data. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happened as the economy began to tank uh, during the Trump administration. Let's face it, we, we look at unemployment, uh, you know, structural unemployment, etc. Uh, we are probably doing as poorly as we've ever done since World War II in, in a lot of these indications of the economy. So, uh, in 2015.98% uh, of, of persons age 12 and older experienced at least one violent victimization uh, and that's kind of a horrible statistic to deal with. We're, we're talking about almost 1% of our population is subject to some kind of violent victimization. Uh, the prevalence rate of violent victimization declined in persons age 12 and older um, and, and you know uh, in 2015. So uh, we see good news, bad news, so to speak, but, but none of it is really good news, right? Let's talk now, let's change gears a little bit about hate crime. And uh, hate crime gets a lot of publicity. The incidence of hate crime is uh, going up. And of course, as hate crimes are established, then they're reporting greater frequency as there's a mechanism to do so. So we always have to come back and ask the question, are hate crimes going up or is it a factor that we're getting better at recording them and detecting them and classifying them as such? And what we'll see is there's probably both things happening, right? So the Hate Crime Statistic Act defines hate crimes as those that manifest evidence of prejudice based on race, based on gender or gender identity, religion, disability, sexual orientation, or ethnicity, right? So the case of Matthew Shepard kind of brought this to the public eye. And remember how that works. We talked about this at the beginning of the course. We have some offense that appears so heinous and the press picks it up and it attracts national attention that people rally behind that incidence with the ever familiar mantra, there ought to be a law. And then that inspires politicians to get laws on the books, right, to satisfy that request from the public, at least sometimes. <laughs> so the case of Matthew Shepard, he's beaten with a revolver and left for dead, tied to a fence post. What was his crime? He was gay. And, and some guys in a bar who were drinking with him or what have you didn't like the fact that he was gay, so they felt that entitled him, hey, Penelope, to beat him and leave him for dead. That is, and, and this is why hate crimes attracted the attention they did and have a special set of laws. Because, I mean, this becomes purposeless. When, when we start picking on people uh, on the basis of their identity, uh, what, what can we say, right? 45 states now have hate uh, crime laws. And, but then if we take the flip side, right, and we say, well, there's a need to develop this hate crime law, right? Needs assessment. Let's suppose we pass the needs assessment bar. There's a need for this. And the need then is going to present itself in these hate crime laws. That's going to be the policy. And then ultimately, we have to evaluate the effectiveness. But let me, let me ask you this, just playing uh, the other side here for a minute. What does this do beyond charging someone for murder? I mean, if you murder someone because of their ethnicity, or if you murder them simply for some other reason, murder is murder, some people will argue. And if murder is murder, then the, the hate crime label, what does it facilitate? And I'll leave that to answer. I'm not saying it doesn't facilitate anything. Uh, believe me, I, I'm, I'm okay with uh, hate crime legislation. I'm, you know, uh, I've studied Nazis, I've done research on Nazis, white supremacists, etc. And, and I find their behavior and their uh, mentality abhorrent, right? And, and, and the fact that on the basis of hate, millions of people are killed uh, throughout human history, simply on the basis of their identity, their nationality, etc. Uh, I, I this probably one of the most ridiculous things that uh, on my radar. You know, it just makes no sense. The killing in general makes no sense. But to do it on the basis of someone's category membership, 
really does cause most social psychologists to, to just pause and say, what is up with this? And we have our explanations, and we understand our explanations. We have the research to support the mechanisms. But at the end of the day, I think uh, I, as a social psychologist, step back and say, you know, this is just a testament to how messed up humankind can be, right? So when we move from hate crimes, let's move to sexual harassment. And the term didn't exist until 1974. Before that, I mean, it was kind of like open season. Uh, and estimates of incidents usually come from surveys. So, for example, let's look at a couple surveys here, just general data. 20,000 federal employees surveyed, 42% reported some form of sexual harassment. And we know the, the problems with survey research, let's get methodological here for a minute, that the way the question is asked can make a huge difference in how the question is answered and then it can obviously... Uh, you know, change the data in that regard. Female lawyers in large law firms, 43% report harassment. And uh, I, d I don't doubt this. Uh, when I was in graduate school for a couple years, I was working part-time, shh, because we're not supposed to. We all did, but shh. So I was working part-time in a law firm, and my job was easy. All I did was w I went to foreclosure sales. W when the bank forecloses on property, then the sheriff forecloses, and it goes up for auction at, very, at the county level. And I would just go on behalf of the bank, you know, because the law firm serviced these foreclosures, I would go on the half of the bank and just bid the property until it got to the level the bank would accept, and then I stopped bidding, and, and if someone wants to purchase it at that point, they can go on from that point. Great job. All it did was require me to drive, and I got to see a lot of Ohio. I probably have been to 40, 45 county seats in Ohio, which is pretty cool over a couple of years, right? A lot of driving, put a lot of miles on my car, but it paid well. And I could do a lot of thinking about my research, homework, et cetera, as I'm driving about. So female lawyers in large law firms, I would go into the law firm in downtown Columbus. And I would go in, and I would, in fact, then get the paperwork from whoever was working the foreclosure area. And this law firm hired women, you know, and let's go, uh, you know, egalitarianism, et cetera. Uh, the, the strange thing is, is it's like every woman that was hired into that law firm was pretty good looking. I mean, if we use that standard scale of 1 to 10, we're talking the women who are getting into high, uh, hired into this law firm, and there's no women below 8, 9, and 10 is much more uh, common. And you say, that kind of defies the, the law of averages, but whatever. And uh, it made me curious, though, and I did some informal studies where while I was spending time there just kind of hanging out, I could observe for a couple hours, and I was able to demonstrate that the more attractive someone is, the more visits they got to their desk. Now, is that showing attention on the base of attractiveness sexual harassment? That remains questionable, and we'll get into this a little more, but I remember one time, and you're going to need to excuse my language here because I'm just going to say it verbatim. Uh, I, I went into the law office to pick up some foreclosure materials so I could get on my way, and the female attorney who was going to give me the materials, I, I bumped into her in the lobby. We walked back to her cubicle, and uh, when we got to her cubicle, there was a piece of paper on her chair. It appeared to be a certificate type of paper. And she said, what is this? And she picks up the certificate and she says, look, I've been voted the most fuckable in the office. And I'm like, oh my holy shit, you know? And she didn't seem irritated or disturbed. She just kind of took it in stride. And I guess to work in that environment, in that office, that's probably the expectation that you take that kind of stuff in stride. Uh, so females, lawyers, and large law firms. And what I find so funny is, who would bring sexual harassment suits? I mean, who's going to argue them in court as lawyers, you think lawyers would know better than anyone else that you probably shouldn't be engaging in this kind of behavior. Female graduate students? rate up to 60%. Uh, you know, so let's just say that we've established a certain level of prevalence of sexual harassment. And, and I'm sure many of you from your own experience know how common it can be. Now, the definition of sexual harassment, the Civil Rights Act of 1968, Title VII, right, provides legal basis for outlawing it. So it created the mechanism that allows 
us to, in fact, make it illegal and bring these cases to court. There's lots of confusion, though, and debate about what constitutes sexual harassment. Now, on the one hand, from a legal point of view, but let's just talk from a moral point of view. You guys, you, you all know the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, a lot of people over the last decade or so have thought about the golden rule and say, yeah, but really we need a rule that's probably a little kinder and a little more empathetic. So we start with pushing forward the platinum rule. Treat others as they would like you to treat them. So now it's not my standard of judgment and how people should be treated, but to be truly empathetic, I should treat someone as they want to be treated. Right? So we can see that from a moral basis, sexual harassment is pretty easy to understand. If you don't want me to talk that way about you and you say, don't talk to me that way, and then I don't because I engage in the platinum rule, which is to do unto you as you're requesting that I do, right? So I'm a big fan of the platinum rule, and I'm, I'm always talking about the platinum rule to try and get us get it on our radar, right? So the United States EOC is the major force in the definition and enforcement. Now, EOC began as an advising body, but has become increasingly more an enforcement body through the use of litigation. So let's talk about the EEOC's definition, and it's unwelcome sexual advances, verbal or physical conduct, when acceptance is a term of employment. And this can be either implicit or explicit. So it doesn't have to be explicitly stated. It's like, hey, you either have to do this or no job. If, right, a plaintiff can show that implicitly this is the understanding, but never clearly or outwardly stated, it can mean the same thing, right? Or if submission is used to make employment decisions, that is, this person submitted, this person did not, so guess who gets the job? And this would apply to promotions as well, right? It reasonably interferes with work or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. And whether that's the intention or not. So again, it's not so much what I think this means, but it's what the potential person who's feeling victimized thinks, right? So, and, and the hostile workplace harassment, I, I remember at the paper mill, I was there uh, at, at the Wallula mill about the time that hygiene studies uh, and inspections regarding sexual harassment were taking place. The law was uh, getting more teeth at that point in time, and as an organization, the Wallula Mill had 550 people working there. It was a big mill, right? And, and the idea was that we have to, we have to come into compliance with the sexual harassment. And that meant just walk around, you know, by, by certain inspection teams, we would form volunteer inspection teams and walk around. And if there's playboys hanging on the wall, and that could include in someone's locker or whatever, where when they open it's visible, then that's got to go. The graffiti in the bathroom's got to go. That, that all this stuff that creates this tension or this anxiety, even in one employee, has no place at work. We're there to work. Right? We're not there to, you know, excite our prurient interest. We're, we're there to do a job. So things that were of a sexual nature had to be removed, Any, anything offensive. So, now what do the courts say? The courts say that really we can boil sexual harassment down to two types. Quid pro quo, and that term's gotten an awful lot of... Uh, talk, not necessarily in terms of sexual harassment, but in, in the government o over the last year or two. Sexual demands in exchange for employment benefits, right? And, and this is straight up, hey, sexual coercion, do this to get that. Quid pro quo, this for that, is the rough translation of the Latin. Now, hostile workplace uh, harassment includes both gender harassment and unwanted attention. So this is what I was kind of alluding to when I told you about my informal studies in the law firm, that the more attractive the employee, the more attention they received. And I operationalized attention as how many visits do they get to their desk. Now you can see there could be a lot of flaws with that study, and that's why I'm simply calling it an informal study, uh, just an observation. Right? But the focus is on how this affects harassment, I mean, how this, uh, how this harassment affects the workplace and one's ability to do their job. So if your job as a new attorney is to write legal decisions, 
let's say. It takes time to write legal decisions. And if you have this constant influx of visitors, because you're so darned attractive, this constant influx of visitors, they could be distracting you from your work, and someone else could be completing more work and become more competitive promotion-wise than you do. Or if it's a probation period where they're going to assess your performance, let's say, over six months and make a permanent hiring decision, you can see where this could really interfere with someone's opportunities. And hence the need for the law, right, I, I'm, I'm playing needs assessment here. Now, frequency and severity are taken into account. So single incidents will hardly ever qualify, right? And, and what this does is it kind of puts the onus on the victim or the potential victim saying, hey, I need to work. You got you to gotta stop visiting my desk less often, all right? Or, uh, no, I don't want to go out with you. And please don't bother me by asking again. So a single statement like this is enough to put the brakes on this behavior. Now, if the behavior continues past this statement, then it's time to get human resources or whoever else involved in the organization. And we know at the university, right, we have Title IX compliance. And all of us are trained in Title IX. So if you're being harassed, please talk to someone, say something, uh, and, and get the ball rolling because this is what protects you in the future. If the harassment continues, then there's policies that can likely be enforced. But to remain silent then increases the probability of remaining a victim of this kind of uh, noxious behavior. Questions? So what does psychology have to say about this? Because this is psychology and the law. Uh, well, the psychological contribution folks on predicting when it will occur uh, prior and colleagues. Now, I mean, you're going to, every once in a while, we're going to talk about some stuff, maybe more than every once in a while in this class, where you say, well, thank you for that, Dr. Obvious. Who the hell didn't know that? And that is certainly a problem in, in psychology and social psychology in particular. We often, and I'm going to show you examples throughout the course, we often have a theory that is common sense. You say, well, that's just common sense. And I say, yeah, it's common sense. But you know what? In reviewing the literature, no one has ever provided empirical support for that common sense. So I take the common sense, I craft some hypotheses, I test them in a laboratory setting or what have you, and then I get the empirical data that supports my hypotheses, which supports the common sense, and we get to publish it. But once. I mean, that's about it. It's not something we get to rehash over and over again. Demonstrate it once. We're good to go, right? There might be replications in different circumstances. But sometimes psychologists are left with the very simple work of just empirically supporting what we already know to be true or common sense. But common sense, if we don't empirically support it, common sense might be wrong. Common sense might be propaganda that's being shoved into our noodle, right? So the empirical support of common sense is a critical aspect of critical thinking. So high scores on likelihood to sexually harass scale are associated with, and you go, wait, wait a second. There is a scale that assesses likelihood to harass. Of course, because social psychologists develop a frickin' scale for everything imaginable on the planet, right? So why not this as well? What do we know? Well, and once we develop a scale, typically what we do in scale design is say, hey, we developed this scale, and now we're gonna measure people using the scale. We're gonna measure them with some other scales that are similar or related constructs, and we're gonna look for correlations between the scales. It's part of an ongoing validation process of these scales. High scores on likelihood to sexually harass, what are they associated with? They have more acceptance of myths about rape. We'll talk about those in a little bit. They tend to have more coercive of sexual fantasies. Right? There are more stereotypical beliefs about male sex roles and you, you observe a greater distance between their belief of male sex roles and female sex roles. Right? They often demonstrate a strong need to dominate women and seek sexual contact as a vehicle for demonstrating that dominance. Now, that's about the individual aspects, right? So individual differences might lead to greater potential for harassment. But 
let's also consider that environments can have an influence as well. Some environments make sexual harassment more likely to occur. So at this law firm, you know, yeah, sexual harassment was relatively prevalent. There were people that were having, you know, uh, affairs within, within the context of this uh, business. It's also, I was astounded that, that there was a lot of drinking that went on with this business. And I don't know if that's typical of all law firms, but after work, quite often it was like, hey, let's go do happy hour. And often, you know, if, if the partners were there at happy hour or they invited everyone to happy hour, they were picking up the, f the tab. And so it's like an open tab, right? And everyone is getting pretty, pretty <laughs> inebriated on the basis of this, at least those who like to drink. And, uh, you know, the, the bar tab for this particular firm could go anywhere from twenty to $25,000 a month. So, again, alcohol doesn't cause it, but it can diminish inhibitions to doing it, right? It can impair good judgment. So, the environment, that the, this is something that happens. We work hard, we play hard, but the nature of the play and the nature of the level of inebriation can lead to issues that might uh, increase the potential for harassment. Now, when I was talking about affect the norms of appropriate behavior, this is one of the reasons we do our hygiene inspections in the lumber mill is we're doing two things. We're removing the offensive material or asking for it to be removed, but we're also setting a standard saying this is no longer acceptable. Right? In general, environments that encourage objectification of women or prime sexual harassment motives, uh, you know, in those cases, then men who are predisposed to this they have the predisposition, but the environment then enhances uh, the ability to uh, give in to that predisposition. So it really is about people, and it is about environment, and, and that would please any social psychologist in trying to understand the problem. Okay, so the discussion leads from sexual harassment uh, to battered women, and one of the first things that we typically want to know is how big a problem is it? And that is, what is the incidence? And Walker estimates half to a third of American women are abused at some point. And, and abuse can take many forms, so if the number seems high, uh, maybe not so much. Domestic violence is as likely, though, to be female on male as male on female. So it, it's not a, you know, a single, a unidirectional phenomenon. It occurs both ways in about an equal prevalence. The big difference is, is that men tend to be bigger, stronger, and therefore inflict more damage. So it, there is an asymmetry as far as the actual results of the victimization. Women are 3.7 times more likely to be killed by their partner than by a stranger, which parallels what we were talking about with the NCVS. Now, myths about battered women abound. And these are the myths that people use to justify uh, this behavior or to minimize what they want to perceive as the incidence of the behavior. So one justification is, well, they're masochists. So women who are being abused are, are women that want to be abused. They actually enjoy being abused or at least see them in that role. They're masochists. They provoke uh, the assaults that if women would just behave, then maybe they wouldn't be battered. Right? They get what they deserve. I mean, if you run a tight ship, if you run a good household and you behave, for your man, then you uh, won't get abused. And if you are getting abused, then it must be because you deserve to be abused. And notice, of course, I will repeat again that these are myths about battered women. Women are free to leave any time. And of course, this is a horrible myth in that often in these situations, the woman has no control over finances, no control over what she can do. She often, if she leaves, she wants to take the children with her so they're not subject to abuse, but doesn't have the wherewithal to do this. So another myth, they can leave at, at any time. Uh, violence isn't that common. We've also s already seen the, the the notions on prevalence. Men who are not violent with others aren't violent with their spouses either, and this is often used when we explain, well, he's a nice guy at work, I can't believe he would batter his wife at home. Different worlds, different environments, so that one doesn't fly either. Some people offer it's only a low SES or a minority problem, and these are usually wealthy white people, right? Because they're just pawning it off completely on group membership rather than acknowledging the potential. 
And finally, let's go with, hey, they're passive. They never try to defend themselves, and we're going to see how bogus that is uh, because most of us learn defending oneself carries its own consequences, either with criminal sanctions or with more severe battering. Right? So uh, what we see then is the clear majority of adults subscribe to some of these, and at least a third uh, endorse most. And that third number has become way too obvious in this country over the last four or five years. A third of the population, or let's say 20 to 30 percent of the population, uh, might be looking at the world a little differently than the majority of the population. The cycle of violence, well, what happens? What we observe is early on batterers or potential batterers are, are attentive, they're loving, they're, they're often model spouses, right? Uh, but then something happens. There's a tension building phase, right? A and this, this tension builds over time. And then we might see it begin with verbal criticisms. And those might escalate then to minor physical assaults. And then, then we hit that acute battering incidence where serious abuse takes place. And invariably, the abuser at that point then develops some level of contrition. I'm sorry. I don't know what got into me. I had a bad day, all this. And, and then they apologize for the attack. I'll never do it again. All right? And when we say never do it again... One of the one of the main questions right off the bat is, okay, you're never going to do it again. How do we know that? What has changed so that it won't happen again? And, and I'm going to invoke my two pers Mark's rules for psychology. Two rules. Consider them. Adopt them if you wish. Rule number one of psychology: you can't change people. Now, it's not to say people can't change, because people change, and people change all the time. But you can't change people. They can change of their own volition, but we can't change people. So number one, you can't change people. Number two, when trying to predict future behavior, the best indicator of future behavior is past behavior, all else being equal. Now, again, that's not to say that it's a perfect predictor, but I'm saying it's a high probability predictor. So if you can't change people, and past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior, it supports the notion of the cycle of violence. The, the uh, offender will apologize for the attack quite often, and then they promise to reform. Now, sometimes people say, well, you know, what about therapy? And, and this is a big deal. Uh, if someone agrees, if you have an offender, right, someone who's battered their wife, and the wife says, look, if we're going to stay together, then we're going to have to do couples therapy. And the person resists, says, I don't need no therapy. I ain't doing no therapy. I don't believe in therapy. Then they pretty much said what's going to happen in the future, haven't they? I mean, if they're not willing to engage at that, at their partner's behest, the partner's requesting, please, to stay in this relationship, we need to go in therapy. This is this is critical to my wanting to stay in this relationship. And someone says no. All right. So, two rules. Right. Take them for, for if you wish and run with them, or or ignore them. <laughs> so, but the perceptions of victims. Now, victims are often met with uneasiness, and they don't want to. Uh, their friends, etc., don't want to hear about it, or, or their relatives don't necessarily want to hear about it. It might bring up things about their own relationship, right? And it might even cause hostility uh, because it might confront people with things that they don't want to think about, as it affects them themselves. Often people are seen as doormats. If this is someone, oh, well, you know, it's no wonder she gets abused because she just lets him walk all over him. Or that's not really abuse. She's just over the top. She's overreacting to almost anything that goes on. Hence, they're delusional alarmists. Now, if the woman retaliates, that is, tries to get even or tries to defend, often they're charged with found guilty of serious crimes if, if they attempt to retaliate. And notice that... that Part of this is systemic because we see an elevated incidence of spousal abuse within law enforcement. So when you call law enforcement, what you're saying is, well, there's an increased probability that the person who's responding to this call is an abuser themselves. And that is problematic in itself. If we see the same thing, let's say, in district attorneys and or lawyers, then it might be difficult to get a fair shake for the victims.
if they do retaliate, right, only a small minority actually kill their mates, and when they're charged with the murder of their mate, which they almost invariably will be, uh, they, they'll try to claim insanity uh, or, or self-defense. And, and these are problematic uh, defenses to maintain. Let's look. One of the defenses is battered women's syndrome, and it's a collection of symptoms and reactions, hence we call it a syndrome. When you have a collection of symptoms, then we invoke the term uh, a syndrome, right? It's a sense of learned helplessness that, that no matter what I do, it doesn't do any good. I can have dinner on time. I can have the house clean. I can do this. I can do that. And I still get my ass kicked around, right? So what's the point? There's nothing I do will make any difference, right? And we might see increased domination by the batter socially isolating the victim and making them economically dependent. That is limiting their potential for escape and limiting their potential to get help. Uh, the victim often becomes more and more fearful and, and maybe really kind of believes that the offender sooner or later is going to batter them to the extent that they, they just kill them. Right? And this is a very realistic concern. Uh, that the, They might exhibit shattered self-esteem that is, they feel unworthy. They may feel guilty, and they may feel guilty because they're not standing up for themselves. They may feel guilty for doing something that caused or triggered the batterer. They may feel guilty for not protecting their children in the way they believe that they should. And this can lead to a sense of shame. Right? And, and when someone's ashamed, then they typically are less likely to seek out help or support. They may feel rage, right, with no outlet for that rage, or there may be that rage may be displaced on other targets. Uh, and, and certainly, resentment is going to be part of the constellation of feelings. Finally, this can develop into a, a post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder. Uh, symptom hypervigilance, and that is they're they're really in tune with the body language, uh, the tone of voice, uh, the the environment uh, of the batterer, right? And and, and the, the, they're searching their environment for signals of potential upcoming violence. So let's suppose the woman retaliates and offers some elements of battered woman syndrome you know, as a temporary insanity or, or some other. And we're going to get a lot into insanity defense, I promise, a huge amount in Lecture 10, right? Is it a good defense? Without a doubt, no. No, nope, it's a losing defense. Most women who kill abusive uh, partners are convicted. Most. That's the way it goes. Hard to make a self-defense claim because self-defense usually requires the presence of an immediate physical threat. And if we're going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, if this is the actual battering incident, the man is probably overpowering the female victim and makes self-defense improbable at that point, right? So often women take their chance by lying in wait or somehow uh, surreptitiously planning. And for example, Lorena Bobbitt has had it with her husband. He's abused her enough. So Lorena Bobbitt, middle of the night, husband's asleep. She takes out her sewing scissors, boom, cuts off her husband's penis. <laughs> Once she cuts off her husband's penis, she's kind of shocked herself, and, and she runs out of the house uh, and, and gets in the car and drives away to somewhere as fast as possible, realizing it, I know, realizing at this point in time she still has the penis in her hand, she tosses it out the car window and speeds away. Uh, as the paramedics respond, right, they actually notice the penis in the street, pick up the penis, and uh, put it on ice. It's, it's surgically reattached for Baba. Uh, an extreme case, high-profile case, but think about it. This is a crime uh, against a male who is sleeping. This is not going to go well, typically, for the defendant uh, in, in this crime. Okay. So we move from battered women's syndrome, spousal abuse, to child abuse. Super hard to estimate the incidence and, and hard to define necessarily what constitutes child abuse. Uh, I've asked uh, earlier, were you spanked? Were you victims of corporal punishment? And does that constitute abuse? At what level does that become abuse, right? And now we're talking physical abuse, but what about verbal and emotional abuse? Uh, neglect, if you will, which is kind of uh, 
you know, psychological abuse, but not explicit, more imp implicit, if you will. Some claim a third to a fifth of all women and a seventh uh, of all men were sexually abused before age 18. Right? Uh, and, and a fifth of children experience an injury as a result of abuse. 1,500 children die as a result of abuse each year, sexual and physical abuse. Right? What, what are some of the consequences of child abuse? Well, abused children may increase... Uh, experience increased mood and anxiety disorders, and not surprising, right? Uh, they might demonstrate inappropriate sexual behavior, and this is uh, something to consider, and if you work with children, you know, you've been probably trained about this, but if a child starts using language or using terms that you wouldn't expect would be typical for a child of that age, it might give one pause to ask some questions and perhaps further investigate, right? Or if they're making, if they're acting out sex acts, etc. Uh, this would not be something a six or seven year old would necessarily be doing. Uh, and if they are, then we have to ask, where did they learn that? Why are they doing that, right? And, and this, the, the anxiety, the distraction, the mood disorders can impair school performance and set the child up for less than optimal outcomes uh, again and again and again. So long-term effects, abused children more likely to develop mental disorders. Uh, the suffer subsequent victimization uh, and, and engage in criminal conduct as adults because the, their moral compass, right, that they're not getting a good moral example so it's hard for them to internalize morals, good system of values to uh, guide their behavior in the future. So we see this cycle of abuse that, that occurs. Now the psychology of rape. Uh, as with battered women misabound, women cannot be raped against their will, which is probably one of the silliest comments we'll hear in this course. Most women secretly want to be raped. No, I, no. Accusations of rape are fixed, right? And that is somehow, uh, when males commit this crime of rape, somehow males cast themselves as victims. Isn't that fascinating? That the attacker casts themselves as a victor, being victimized by the woman, being victimized by the system that doesn't listen to men, they only listen to women, right? And women make this shit up, and the system eats it up and punishes the men. Uh, you know, the, this typical level of, of bullshit, right? Due to the one-on-one -on -one nature, though, of the event and confusion about how rape is defined, the victim then is going to be subjected to incredible scrutiny, more so than probably any other crime that occurs towards a victim. Now, the incidence of rape, well, the industrial world, the U.S. has the highest rate, as I said earlier, 75 to 85 for every 100,000 females. This is probably only a small fraction that actually occur, that uh, is reported, right? M many rapes go unreported, and that's one of the benefits, as we discussed earlier, of the NCVS allows us to tap into unreported crime. Right? It may be as low as a fifth or a tenth of the actual number of rapes are actually reported. Note that though that figure is going to have uh, some discussion surrounding it. And, and think of all the reasons that rape might go unreported, and, and we could generate a long list. Young women, young men are more likely to be victims of rape, and yes, I'm adding men into this conversation. Right? Of X for victims, well, rape trauma syndrome. And emotional responses, not a lot different than battered women's syndrome when you get right down to it, uh, but probably a longer list, if you will, than for battered win women's syndrome. It can be fear, it can be guilt, it can be shame, blame, blaming oneself, right? We talked about defensive attributions much earlier in the course, uh, that it's... Uh, People want to blame the victim in certain instances to protect themselves. Well, notice that, that even the victim blaming themselves offers a sense of control because it offers this, this weird possibility that maybe if I do things differently in the future, this won't happen again. Right? So it might actually, ironically, restore some sense of control. A loss of autonomy, that is calling one's own shots. And, and a, a, a control over body. Uh, maybe feeling that one's body is not one's own, uh, and, and developing a lack of trust. And it could be a lack of trust in men in general or, or uh, people in general. Disturbance in functioning, we might see disruptions to sleep patterns, eating patterns, uh, social withdrawal. 
right? Problems in sexual functioning, because this gets right to the core kind of of the issue. Uh, and then we might see changes in, in uh, lifestyle, like obsessive checking behavior, checking the door, uh, checking the windows, etc. Um, uh, major life changes, moving, uh, getting a different job, more likely to lose their job or income as a result of the trauma they're experiencing that might interfere with their performance, and maybe get divorced. That some men, uh, if their spouse is raped, some men, you know, can't handle that, or I shouldn't say can't handle that, but won't handle it, and uh, won't participate in, in couples therapy that could move the couple past it. So often divorce is a, is a part of the consequence of this. Now, legislation, court decisions, basic definition of rape, non-consenting sexual contact by force or coercion. The, the definition has become increasingly broad over time. Uh, as women gain more political power, uh, we, we can watch this definition become broader. Uh, until the 1980s, and this is an example of what I'm saying here, four-fifths of states imposed a resistance standard. So 80% of the states up until the 1980s, said, if you don't resist, it isn't rape. And this is a horrible situation for a victim because basically maybe someone's being held down, they have a knife at their throat, they're being raped, and yet that's not going to count as rape unless they resist. And I don't know too many people who are willing to resist when a knife is being held to their throat and, and they're overpowered, right? The laws prior to the 1980s really didn't distinguish in different degrees of rape and different characteristics of rape. States didn't recognize spousal rape, that it was impossible to charge a spouse with rape because the idea was that spousal relationship really implies ownership and one can take sex whenever they want it. They can't be denied sex. And, and spousal rape is now obviously a, a crime. So, rape shield laws, well, the idea was the unfortunate rape victims, when they try to bring a case of rape in court, their past history is subject to a tremendous amount of scrutiny. And, and rape shield laws were designed to prevent this level of scrutiny, and that is uh, this kind of victim blaming that would go on in court. Uh, so it was a, a real attempt at a solution to a real problem, because if women believe that they're going to be further victimized in court, essentially, the, the, the idea that they're going to then report the crime and take it all the way to court uh, becomes a loser. They, they know that the court won't support them in their effort to make things right, so they would be less likely to report and or go all the way to court. So these rape shield laws typically prohibit inquiries about defendant's sexual past, except for special circumstances, and then this opens the door right, to go right back to inquiring about the past. In, in reality, rape victims are, are still subjected to intense scrutiny by lawyers, judges, and, and jurors. Right. Now, does it matter? I mean, I've already given you one reason why it might matter, but what happens, what is, what is the effect of the victim's past sexual history in the context of the court case? Well, I studied rape laws and developed a study to test whether some jurisdictions classified as prejudicial really was. And, and the independent variable then is the type of information presented about the victim and, and are all familiar and going to become increasingly familiar dependent variable is the conviction of the defendant in this case. Results, restrictive states were right. Mock jurors were less likely to convict when they heard evidence about the past sexual history. So just mentioning past sexual history, even if one has one, then lowered the probability that the defendant of the rape, uh, the, the one accused of committing the rape, was less likely to be convicted. And then often what we do in these types of studies is then try to tap into why, what was the elements of the decision-making process that went on. And so mock jurors' you know, reactions to rape victims who are low in empathy for the rape victim rate the attacker less responsible. Now, what we see then, they're going, those lower in empathy 
right? The victim is more responsible, and they also intend to interpret the facts differently. And what's fascinating here, I want to introduce this idea of motivated reasoning that was brought to us by Ziva Kunda circa uh, 1990. And what Ziva said is, if we have a predefined, if we have a desired reasoning outcome, that is, I want to think about this, and I want the ultimate conclusion to be this conclusion, then what I do is I weight facts that support my conclusion as more credible. And facts that would refute my desired conclusion, then I rate as less credible, right? So we actually manipulate the information we've received as being credible or not credible on the basis of our desired conclusions. So you can see how that's a, a good expl explanation of the social cognition behind this process. Now, acquaintance rape, three quarters of rapes are committed by someone the victim knows. Less likely to be reported in these cases, and we already know the reporting rate sucks, right? Now, date rape, if you will, or acquaintance rape, differs from stranger assault. It tends to occur on weekends, late in the evening, which kind of makes sense, right? This may be when we're going out. Tend to involve situations in which the victim or attacker have been using drugs and alcohol, and often the attacker facilitates this process by using drugs and alcohol. Uh, I hope that I don't need to tell you all that you need to guard your drinks. Your drink should never be out of your hand in a public place. The second you put it down and fail to keep your eyes on it, the second you put it down, dump it and get yourself a new one, right? This is all too common that people use Rufinol or what the hever else, right, to help them take advantage of victims. If someone is plying you with alcohol, if someone says, hey, have another drink, hey, have another drink, I got to stand back and say, what are they trying to do here? You know, uh, they're taking on the role of a pusher. They are pushing this drug onto you. What is their purpose in so doing, right? Less likely to involve weapons. Attackers rely on verbal threats. Hey, I'm going to tell, you know. Or, you know, that picture I have of you on my phone, how do you like it if everyone gets to see that picture? Uh, the, let's not do the picture thing, right? Let's not, let's not share those things because that shit comes back to, to bite you, right? Also associated with dates in remote locations or when the mail paid all the expenses. Let's take the last part first. The mail pays expenses. Some men might feel that they're entitled then to some recompense for the expenses. Remote location, you got to say, why is this person taking me out in the middle of nowhere? Uh, boy, I have no access to any kind of assistance should I need it. So be your own best uh, kind of watchdog in this regard. Now, post-victimization disorders, acute stress disorder, Dissociative symptoms associated with PTSD, ASD, sense of numbing, a sense of detachment, uh, absence of emotion, uh, repressed emotion, reduction of awareness, and that is just in a general inattentiveness, right? Uh, what we also see is persistent re-experience re of the traumatic event, um, anxiety or increased arousal. And notice that has an adaptive function, right? Impairment to, to, uh, or ability to complete necessary tasks. And for ASPD, it lasts two days to four weeks after the event. If it persists beyond that or has a later onset, then we know PTSD is indicated. And, and PTSD then may experience intense vil, uh, guilt from surviving when others didn't, uh, which may or may not uh, you know, relate to rape specifically, but it could relate to other issues. If uh, you were taken hostage in a bank, let's say with five other people, uh, by some, let's say some terrorists who were robbing the bank, uh, and, and four of those people are killed, and somehow you miraculously survive, you may feel guilt. Why was I the one to survive, right? Especially if those people were close to you. Uh, phobic avoidance of situations that resemble or symbolize the trauma. And, and we develop these somatic markers that situationally uh, tie the situation to the emotional state, right? And these can be activated automatically upon uh, re-exposure to that stimuli, that, to that somatic marker. Impaired affect modulation. I know that sounds super fancy, 
What that means is our our affective stream, be it positive or negative, high or low, right? We become less able to exert any kind of control over that. So that it, that it kind of, and this this can happen as a result of PTSD. It's also part of the grieving process for many people. Right? Yeah, this we might have feelings of hopelessness. The the oh my God, there's nothing I can do, or despair, or hostility, and especially if we're in a situation where we're you know. Uh, accusing someone and the court system feels that they're doing everything they can to stymie our efforts to bring that person to justice. Uh, increased risk of phobia, social phobias, that is going out, being around other people, maybe a, uh, components or behaviors associated with obsessive compulsive disorder, checking behaviors if you will. Uh, ag agoraphobia, right? Agoraphobia? You know that one? If you want to know your phobias, there's like three, four hundred listed phobias out there. You can Google phobias uh, and, and get the phobia list. Agoraphobia, fear of the marketplace. Where did that come from? The marketplace in ancient Greece was called the Agora, right? Below the Acropolis was the Agora. Substance-related disorders, that is, you know, compensatory substance abuse to try to uh, take care of uh, maybe uh, emotional numbing, etc. Or to um, help one forget the incidents, and these are rarely, effect if ever, effective. So let's kind of close this out, and, and I just want to give you a, a short laundry list, right? Um, uh, contributing disorders to violence, and when we look, you know, uh, as psychologists at various psychological disorders, we might then want to say, are there some disorders that might contribute to violence to a greater extent than others? Well, antisocial personality disorder. So we've discussed that, right? Uh, in what lecture three? Psychopathy. And, and note that psychopathy is often uh, one of the components of psychopathy is an amazing lack of empathy, which makes it much easier to do violence towards other people. Borderline personality disorder seems to have uh, a relatively high prevalence of violence. Up to 40% of batterers may display some symptoms of borderline personality disorder. And, and remember that borderline personality disorder is largely uh, uh, associated with fragile self-esteem so that people are unable to weather the attacks on their self-esteem, they often may need to respond violently as a result of this, or, or their lack or loss of adoration. Same with narcissism, right? And we see that as well, that threatened self-esteem uh, can cause violent responding. And then sadism. And let's face it, sadists like to make other people suffer, right? So, you know, part of bullying is, is associated behaviors with sadism. That is, doing things intentionally that we know will cause another pain, right? And, and enjoying having done so. So, uh, sadism. So, all these are potential contributing disorders to violence. And, and I guess, ultimately, I, I think it's important that we, be, we believe that we need to be treated well by others. And to the extent that we're not treated well by others, it really is their problem, not our problem. And, and if someone is not treating us well, if someone is abusing us, if someone is demonstrating violence towards us, we really have to consider that that person, not the victim, but the attacker, has the problem. And often the problem has manifested itself in some type of psychopathology. This relatively incomplete list can, can be some of those. So, uh, that's about the end for victimization. I want to, next one is 6.1, is the gift of fear. So, it's one thing to talk about victimization. It's another to talk about our relationship with fear and how it can have a protective, uh, fear can be kind of a protective blanket. It can be a curse as well, but I, I want to talk about it in terms of De Becker, and that will be in lecture 6.1. Awesome book report. I'm going to put that differently. A decent report. I don't want to be egotistic. It's a decent report on an excellent book. Let's put it that way. So thank you guys, and I hope you have a good day.